Good evening and welcome to Spirit of Grace Church. We're glad that you're able to join us tonight. want to share with you from the Word of the Lord. And uh, we're so thankful that you have chosen to spend a little bit of time with us. I'm reading from Psalm 139. If you'll want to turn there, if you have your Bibles. Psalm 139. I want to read two scriptures. And I want to answer, uh, as the best I can tonight, the question simply, why God made you? Why God made you? I believe that we're living in a day and an age that if we can figure out this question to any depth, then we become more effective as the children of God and as the church. So why why God made you? Psalm 139, verse number 13, says it this way. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. And uh, again, I want to share with you tonight uh, why God made you. And uh, we're going to just get right into it here. You don't have to travel too far around the world until you discover very quickly that God really does love variety. Uh, he's made all shapes, sizes, colors, intensities. There's incredible variety all around the world. Uh, I, del I deliver laundry, and so when I drive my truck in the fall months uh, out into the middle of the country and be able to see all the trees and the changing of the colors and, and things, and then to see that same area coated in snow a few months later and then all green in the spring, it's just amazing how God loves variety. Did you even know that God has made over 300,000 species of beetles? And I'm not talking the car either. Would you call that creative overkill? You see, don't you think the world could have gotten along with, oh, say, maybe 50,000 species of beetles? Why did he create 300,000? I believe he, he did because he likes variety. Uh, here in Minnesota, when we're getting ready for some more snow maybe this weekend, but did you know that in one cubic foot of snow there are 18 million snowflakes and not one of them are alike? And yet nobody else is going to see it but God. Uh, I believe he loves variety. He likes variety in people as well, not just in his creation, but in, in those of us that he created. Have you ever had to wait for an airplane or you sit in a mall? One of the things that I like to do, I let my wife go into all the stores and I'll find a bench somewhere in the mall and just people watch because it's very interesting to watch the different kinds of varieties of people that God created. He made every single one of us an individual. And in Psalm 139, we read that in the King James Version, it said, He, he possessed my reins, he covered me in my mother's womb. I, am, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made, and marvelous are thy works, and my soul knoweth right well. And again, I'll read it one more time in the New Living. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. Job said it this way in Job 10, 8, Thine hands have made me and shaped me together or fashioned me together round about. And so through this passage, I want to share a couple of truths with you today. First, I want you to know that I'm unique and you're unique. There's not anybody in the world like us uh, or like you. There never has been. There never will be. When God created you, the mold was broken. And God doesn't major in creating carbon copies. He only creates originals. Uh, so to that, tonight, you need to understand that why God made you, you're unique, you are unique. If you were to search the whole world, you wouldn't find two people that had the same footprint or fingerprint or voice print. You are your own person, and you are unique in God. Why did, you, why did God make you different than all of the people of the world that have ever lived? Why did he go to all that trouble? I believe he wants you to know just how special you are, how much you matter to him, how unique you are to him. So that's the first truth. You're unique. There's nobody else like you. Uh, secondly, we're wonderfully complex. How many of you married somebody who's wonderfully complex? And uh, the fact is that you're so complex, many times we become mysteries unto ourselves. Have you ever asked in a certain situation or if something has happened and you, it surprises you how you responded or what you said? Have you ever said something and thought, what was I thinking when I said that? Have you ever felt a certain way? Why do I feel this way? What's happening to me? Sometimes we're a mystery even to ourselves. And uh, 
inside you're thinking, well, if there's, you know, what's wrong with me? There's nothing wrong with us, by the way. We're just unique. You are complex and you are unique. And that's the way God created you. Sometimes we just have to admit, I don't know why I feel this way. Don't know why I said that. I don't know why I thought that. However, God knows because God created us unique and wonderfully complex. And then the third thing is that I believe that, as we read in the book of Job, we were shaped for a pur purpose or a fashion for a purpose. God created everything in the world for the purpose of his pleasure, for his kingdom, for what he's wanting to accomplish, including you and including me. We are not here by accident. You are not living in 2021 by accident. You're not just taking up space. God made you with a purpose or a reason in mind. You were designed by God, and it was his idea. You are not a mistake. He doesn't make mess-ups. Uh, you were planned before your birth, and God did not simply sit down at a computer and randomly access a bunch of components and throw it all together to form you. The Bible says very clearly that you were purposefully, personally, orderly planned and designed by God. His loving hand made you exactly the way you are. You're not an accident. God had a perfect plan of genetic code for your life. And uh, he didn't just mix it into a mixing bowl and hope that it turned out. You are you because God wanted you to be you. Your uniqueness is what God wants to offer to this world. And so tonight I want to concentrate, for those of you that don't have not been a part of a lot of my teaching, I do like using a, uh, an acronym. And um, so I want to talk about your shape today, S-H-A-P-E. And uh, in most often we talk about shape in, or your purpose, if you will, in the light of your ministry. But today I'm not really talking about ministry. I want to talk to you about your shape and how it affects every other area of your life, your relationship, your career, your finance, your retirement, your enjoyment, your hobbies, your, your, your job, if you will. How God uses your shape in order to affect the other areas of Life And I believe that the Bible gives us at least a combination of five different factors. So the S in shape stands for spiritual gifts. Uh, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7, 7, it says this, Each man has his own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. There are at least 20 listed in the Bible, if not more. And we're not going to look at them all in detail tonight. But uh, other than to say this, every believer, every person has at least one, and that gift that he placed in you is designed to be used to benefit others. Every time you do something and you do it well, and you do it and you enjoy doing it, you are revealing to others and to yourself the giftedness that God has placed in you. And the Bible says that God, and God has said, every believer has some spiritual gift. And so I want to look a little bit at how that uh, impacts our work and life, etc. tonight. The letter H in the word shape, so you have spiritual gifts, then the letter H is heart. The heart is what drives you. It what It's what motivates you. All of us have different motives. All of us have different drives. All of us have different interests. Uh, would you agree with me tonight that there are some things that you care about very deeply and there are other things that you couldn't really care less about? That's revealing your heart. It's revealing the seed of your passion. It's, it's, and sometimes it's the heart that causes a lot of uh, conflict in marriage because we have different hearts. We have different motivations. We have different drives. And the Bible says it in Revelation 17. It said this, God has put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose. In Philippians 2.13, it says, For it is God who works in you, inspiring both the will and the deed for his own chosen purpose. See, God, the Bible says elsewhere, if you delight in the Lord, he'll put, give you the desires of your heart. He puts desires into your heart. And the way you discover what your heart is or what the basic motivation of your life, that drive, that passion, um, is to ask yourself, well, what do I love to do? What do I really love to do? What is it that I think about when I, my mind is just wandering and, and, and not planning and trying to fit into a schedule of 
list, a schedule or a list of things to do and accomplish? What do I really daydream about? What does my mind automatically turn to? You see, you cannot get away from the basic interests that God has implanted in your life. I want to say that again. You cannot get away from the basic interests that God has implanted in your life. You're unique in that. I'm unique in that. He's given us spiritual gifts. He's given us a heart or inborn interest. He says those are for a chosen purpose. Your interest, your drive, your motivation is for a purpose that God placed in you. It's not by accident that you have those uh, certain uh, interests or drives that other people don't have. God needs and wants different kinds of motivations, different kind of passions, different kind of, of, of drive in life to accomplish different things. Remember, God loves variety. The letter A in the word shape, so you have your spiritual gifts, you have your heart, and the letter A stands for abilities. 1 Corinthians 12, 6 says there are different abilities to perform service. A lot of people think that they don't have any ability, but yes, you do. You just haven't recognized them necessarily as abilities. In fact, researchers have shown that the average person, this is the average person, has between 500 and 700 different kinds of abilities. That, that's just the average person. If you can raise your hand, that's an ability. Um, you, you have many, many different kinds of abilities that you just don't recognize necessarily as an ability. But God has said that this is a part of how he shapes us. He gives us a spiritual gift. He gives us a heart. Uh, and, and now he's giving us abilities, created ability into us. Some of you are interested in computers, and some of you are scared to death of computers. Some of you have the natural ability with mechanical things. Many are good with numbers. Many are good with words. Many are good at speaking. We all have different abilities, and that's why there's not one uh, ability that's better than another ability. They're just abilities. Some people have the ability to work with people. Some have the abilities to work with music. Some people can think great ideas and abstract thoughts and put them down on paper and make them make sense. Some people have mechanical minds, engineering minds. God gives you those abilities. You may have an ability to entertain. Other people may fall flat on their face when they try to entertain. You may have an ability to cook. You may have an ability to draw, to speak, to recruit, to research, to landscape. To the, end, the, the abilities are endless. We all have them. They're all different. And those abilities are not by accident. God has given them to us for a purpose. Exodus 31.3 says, I, this is God speaking, I have given him skill, ability, and knowledge in all kinds of crafts. And then in 2 Corinthians 3, 5, Paul says, our competence comes from God. So you see, he's given you spiritual gifts. He's given you a heart. He's given you abilities. And so then it comes to the P of shape, and that is he's given you a personality. Now, some of you have a personality with a capital P. Personality refers really to three things, the way you act, the way you feel, and the way you think. And the root of your personality is the way you think, because the way you think determines the way you feel, and the way you feel determines the way you act. And even the Bible says that the root of your personality is found in your thought life. Proverbs 4.23 says, your life is shaped by your thoughts. And so everybody agrees that personality is very complex. Everybody has a little bit of a different understanding. Researchers have discovered there, there are at least 18,000 different personality traits. And when you put those in combination, combinations are endless. In, in a number of personality traits, you are very complex. But God created you that way. Uh, years ago, I remember there was a, a debate over, is personality something you're born with or is it something that's acquired through the environment around you? Uh, if you ever took developmental psychology in, in college, it's the issue of nature versus nurture. And which is it? Well, it used to be a big debate. I, I don't hear about it very much anymore. And over the years, there's been a lot of studies that show that the moment a child is born, they already have, to a great extent, a set pattern of personality characteristics 
before the environment even comes along. And the environment just kind of accentuates those personality traits or uh, stifles them one, one way or the other. Um, and anybody that's a parent of two children know that. Some babies are born loving and complacent and other babies uh, are, can come out chomping at the bit, daring us uh, to make hit them smile and laugh and they're going to take on the world. And those parents that have more than two children uh, and watch the dynamics at the dinner table can oftentimes think, how in the world did I bring forth this great diversity of children? Because they're all different. And uh, they're all just night and day. And so your personality is a complex part of who you are. It's part of your shape. It's when you. It's your spiritual gifts. It's your heart. It's your ability. It's your personality, and God wants to use all four of those. And then in the letter here in a minute, He wants to use it for a purpose. Your personality, the way you are, is for a purpose in the kingdom of God. He gave it to you, and it's assigned to you. It's not just something that came accidentally. He shaped you for it. He molded you for it. He framed you for it for a reason. Which brings us to letter E, which is. Uh, experience. God plans some experiences in life to help shape you. Romans 8, 28, we like to quote it when things are difficult, but it's really a true statement either way. And we know that all that happens to us is working for our good if we love God and are fitting into his plans. Or as the King James Version says, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. You see, God is both organized and he's purposeful in planning the purple personal experiences that he, he prepares for us. That's a lot of P's in that statement. He's both organized and purposeful in planning the personal experiences he prepares for us. He uniquely allows different things into our life. He doesn't cause them all, but he sees them and he allows even the bad things to bring about good in our life. He wants to work through our experience. And so these five things, spiritual gifts, heart, abilities, personality, and experience, they make you, you. And all that sounds good, but what does that have to do with where we're at today and how we, what, I mean, that's all sounds nice, but what can we say about our shape when we can operate into the, into our aspect of life today? And uh, so I want to, I want to share that for the next couple of minutes. Your spiritual gift, your heart, your ability, your personality, your experience, shape. Your shape, all five factors are interrelated. You are a complex combination of gifts and heart and a personality and abilities and experience. And none of us are the same as the person, even if we've been married for decades. We're still individuals that have different experience and different personalities and different abilities and even different experiences and drive, etc. But they all work together. They're interrelated. Each element, your spiritual gift, will play off of your personality. Your personality will play off of your ability. Your ability will play off of your experience. You are a combination of these five factors. Secondly, I believe that your shape is fixed. It's stable. It endures. It's constant. It's fixed by God. It's the way God created you. The spiritual gifts he's given you, the heart he's given you, the abilities he's given you, the personality he's given you, and the experience are, 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 have caused you to be stable. Your shape does not change. Now, as you go through different stages in life, you have different expressions of that shape, but your shape demonstrates itself very early on in, in life, and it continues with you for a lifetime. You're really, I, I don't freak out about this, but you're not basically any different from when you got started. The basic bent or the basic shape that God made you is still the basic bent or the basic shape that you are today. So what happens as we get older and we, we, we seemingly change or what happens at conversion? What happens when I'm born again? When, when I come to know Christ and, and I'm converted, does, do, is there a huge change? God doesn't slow you down. He just changes the direction you're going. If you look at the life of the Apostle Paul, uh, all of the characteristics you saw in his life before Christ were there after Christ. His zeal, his enthusiasm, his sharp mind, he, he still had all of those after his conversion, 
Um, it's just that now God was using it in a different direction or in a new direction. He channeled them in a new way. So if your personality was bubbly before Christ, it's going to be bubbly after Christ. It's just going to be pointed in a different direction. Paul's personality did not change, but he changed how he used his personality, and he used it for the kingdom of God rather than for what he wanted to use it for. See, your shape is fixed. Your Who you are is fixed because that's the way God created you. If you were a little child pulling pranks uh, when you were young, you're probably still pulling pranks at 85. If you were wheeling and dealing in third grade at recess trading marbles, maybe you're in the rest home uh, you'll probably be wheeling and dealing in bedpans. Who knows? It's in your nature to be a wheeler dealer, if you if you if that's a term. If God has given you the ability to acquire, and some of you have that ability, long after your needs are met, you keep on acquiring. Why? Because you can't do anything about it, um, but to be you. And so, what does God do after your needs are met? He wants you to start using it for something else, for the right way, for his kingdom. Maybe he wants you to acquire for the kingdom of God or for a ministry or for, for something to help other people, any number of things that he has in mind. But once he's got you going, you're going. Once he has your your shape in, in, in mind, your shape is not going to change. So if as a little child you had a caring heart for hurting animals, and maybe you fixed a broken wing on a, uh, on a little bird or a cat's paw, uh, the rest of your life is going to be spent caring for hurting people and hurting animals. You're just made that way. It's fixed in you. It's your shape. You never get tired of doing what you uh, enjoy doing or what you're shaped to do. You don't get bored with it. It becomes, it's who you are. No matter how many satisfying experiences you have, you're always ready for another one. Why? Because that's the way that God made you. And it's why God made you, because he has a specific reason for your shape because your shape is going to minister to somebody in some way. And then number three, your shape is irrepressible. You cannot not be you. In other words, you have to be you. It's all you can be. You, we need to stop trying to be other people. You can't escape being who you are. Now, you can try to be like somebody else, but your real self will always come through. And if you enjoy doing something over and over, you'll repeat it. It'll become a pattern in your life. The fact is, if your job does not allow you to express your basic shape, who you are, it's irrepressible. So you'll find some way to express it if you can't do it at work, maybe through a hobby, maybe through a ministry at church. Some way or shape or form, you're going to get the shape that God created you to be, uh, to be expressed. You see, no matter what the job description says, we form and fit the job until we get to do what we really enjoy doing. And we slough off the stuff that we don't want to do. Why? Because that's the way we're made. Uh, I believe this. I believe the secret of any organization that's going to be strong is for the leaders of that organization to put people in positions that their shape fits and where you don't have to motivate them. It's their niche. It's where they fit. So the question then becomes, well, why do I need to know my shape? You may be listening to this. And you're saying, Pastor, well, all that sounds really well and good, but how do? why do I need to know what my shape is? Well, there's a couple reasons that I want to share with you. Uh, first, there's a random list of issues that explains, that your shape explains. Uh, once you understand your shape, it explains how you respond to authority, how you respond to friends, how you respond to certain situations. It explains how you handle criticism, uh, how you like to be led. Um, the way God has made you and designed you uh, explains how you deal with confrontation, how you handle power, how you handle freedom, how you make friends, why you lose interest in a task and when you do it, uh, why you find it hard to get started in a new activity. You see, your shape explains how you deal with your guilt, which we all have. It's why uh, your shape is why you emphasize what you do. It's why you don't get close to people, or it's why you do get close to people. It could be why you're popular or unpopular. It's all explained by the shape that God gave you. Your shape explains what makes you mad, what makes you sad, what makes you happy, what makes you worried, what makes you joyful, what makes you fearful, because it's you. Your shape is is the expression of who you are. 
And, and so there's there's some if we under if we can ever understand our shape, there's there's several things that begin to to, to really happen that are exciting and and God really begins to honor it. Uh, there's several benefits uh, of building your life around your shape, discovering what your spiritual gifts are, discovering what your heart is, discovering your abilities, your personality, your experiences, looking at them and then building your life in such a way that God has shaped you. For instance, a benefit of knowing your shape is it is a stress reducer. It reduces stress. Because if you understand who you are and and that God made you and that God created you that way and he, he, he built the shape into you, you stop comparing yourself to other people. Now, the Bible tells us in Corinthians we shouldn't do that anyway, but human nature tends to ignore that statement and we end up comparing ourselves, but it's worthless to compare ourselves. If we know that God's shaped us, we stop doing that. We stop trying to do what we're not gifted to do. Uh, I remember there's some people that feel that uh, when I was going into Bible college that everybody that was going to Bible college needed to be some kind of a preacher or a singer or something of that nature. But we need as many doctors and lawyers and construction workers and plumbers and and all kinds of things uh, for the kingdom of God, not just preachers and singers. And uh, so let's stop trying to do what we're not gifted for. You build on your strengths. You recognize your limitations. That's what the shape will do. When you recognize your shape, you'll maximize what you're good at and don't worry about the rest of it. So it's a stress reducer when you understand your shape. It's also a benefit in that it increases your success. And so you have to first ask yourself, what is success? I, I don't believe that success is making a lot of money. I know a lot of people that make a lot of money who aren't successful. I believe success is this. Success is knowing God's will and being right in the center of that journey. Success is being what God meant you to be. It's figuring out who you are and then being who you are. Finding your niche and saying, that's me. That's when you're successful. And I think one of the things that we ought to do is help our younger believers and even our teenagers discover their shape before they get out into the marketplace because uh, it will position them for greater success Rather than most of us, or like most of us, we had to go through four or five different trial and error decisions before we said, oh, this is who I am. This is what God made me. This is what I'm good at. And uh, I believe that education should help people move that way. Uh, your shape determines how you learn. Um, only about 25% of people learn by reading and studying. Others by listening, discussing, actually doing it, seeing it modeled. And so if you happen to learn the way that the school system teaches, you get A's. But if you don't learn that way, you probably don't get as good of grades. It has nothing to really do with your intellect. It has to do with your shape and how God created you. We all learn different ways. Schools ought to teach different ways because people are shaped differently. I believe it this way. I believe that schools, our education system, the number one goal in all of that should not be to overload and figure out information. It should be teaching us how to learn the way we learn best. That's just my aside. But the implications of what I'm talking about, if you understand your shape and you understand who you are, it's mind-blowing because your success rate will go way up. It also will deepen your satisfaction. A satisfying life is when you're doing what you're shaped to do, what God made you to do. Freedom comes from doing what you're gifted to do. You enjoy what God made you to be, and all of a sudden, you feel the love of God on a level or in a depth that's uh, much greater than before, because you're in harmony with what he created in you at the very beginning of the way he shaped you. And the fourth is that it'll build your self-esteem. Doing what you're shaped to do will build true self-esteem. Uh, there's a there's an epidemic going on throughout society today, and that is of low self-esteem. Most people don't like themselves, if the truth were known. They, they, they really don't. One of the reasons, studies say that over 50% of all people in their jobs are in the wrong job. That's an amazing number. And uh, I believe that genuine, not the pop psych self-esteem, but genuine self-esteem is built on two biblical truths. And if we ever get this, we'll be uh, on our way to having great self-esteem. 
It's not raising yourself up by the bootstraps and positive thinking or I'm okay and you're not. It's here, Here's what genuine self-esteem is built on. Number one, it's built on the, on the truth that you matter to God. Jesus proved that you matter. He died on the cross. And when you look in the mirror and you say that I'm not worth it, what you're really saying is that Jesus died for junk. Jesus didn't die for junk. He died for you. Jesus proved how much you matter by giving his life on the cross for you. So that's the first thing that should boost your self-esteem. Jesus paid the ultimate price for you. You're valuable. You mean something. And secondly, you were shaped by God for a purpose. You matter to God and you were shaped by God for a purpose. If, if, if there's no other thing you get from this tonight, get that. You matter to God and he shaped you for a purpose. When we get those two things, that's going to build genuine self-esteem and confidence in our lives. Um, we talk about the first of all, all the time that, that you matter to God. We, we try to impress that upon people. But I want to stress the point tonight even of how God has shaped you for a purpose. He's given you that spiritual gift, the heart, the ability, the personality, the experience for a reason. Maybe you don't feel like life has mattered much to this point, but you, however, he's going to lead you to fulfill that purpose if you will allow him to. I want to, uh, and I'm, I'll be done here in just a couple of minutes, but I want to read a letter that was written to a teacher that stresses the value of somebody's shape. It was from an attorney who resigned his law office to become the director of, director of a thing called the Rescue Mission. And he, he read this letter. It says this, Over the years, you've delivered many encouraging messages. One message has been particularly helpful to me and in turn to others. It comes from Class 301 and concerns our unique shape. I frequently refer to our shape when talking to discouraged men and women along Skid Row. I point out that even the most desperate, tragic situations can form the basis for the good that God can bring out of our lives. In the language of the street, you can't deal God a bad hand. Yesterday, I was struck by the impact of these words that had upon a man named Richard. As a toddler, Richard was abandoned in a hotel room by his prostitute mother. Um, he served overseas. He's had two failed marriages and children with whom he has little or no relationship. In some, at this point in his life, his 40s, he was overcome by pain and frustration and emotionally was, aban was an abandoned child. When I reminded Richard of his unique shape and that God never wastes a hurt, you could see the despair beginning to lift. Though weeping, there was a clear sense of joy and celebration. It was as though God was embracing and tenderly uh, caressing someone who for many years was convinced he was utterly unlovable. I believe that the purpose of Spirit of Grace Church and the purpose of my ministry is first help you to realize that you matter to God. It's the reason why I've stopped telling people how to get to heaven and telling them how to get to Jesus. Jesus loves you so much, he'll take care of getting you to heaven if I can get him to get you to him. He loves you beyond measure. It doesn't matter what you've done in your past. It doesn't matter what you're doing in your present. If you're willing to surrender it all to him and come into his embrace. So that's the first thing is to help you realize that you matter. You do. And then as you establish your relationship in Jesus Christ, I believe it is our church and my responsibility uh, to help you discover who God made you to be. Um, I believe that as leaders, uh, I am personally committed to helping position people for successful, meaningful, fulfilling life in this world based on the shape that God has planted in your life. I believe that every one of you has a gift from, the, from God. I believe that every one of you has a, a heart that motivates you for whatever reason and, and build abilities beyond measure. All of you I know, because I know most of you have personality, and there's all kinds of experience. If we sat down in our church and just began to list all of the different experiences that are found there, it would probably shock and amaze you with what's all in, involved there. Um, and so my hope or my prayer is 
that we would fulfill 1 Corinthians 15, 16, that says this, By the grace of God, I am what I am. I pray tonight that each one of you will not only accept what God made you, but you'll enjoy it, and you'll thank him for it, and you'll see the wisdom of what he did when he shaped you in your gifts, your heart, your ability, your personality, and your experience. And, and that you will say that, you will turn around and you will say, I want to contribute my uniqueness, my shape, to this world or this community, to my friends and my family for the glory of God. You see, the bottom price is the bottom line is this you are absolutely priceless. I want to say that again. You are priceless. What value are you are to God can only be determined by God. And his determination was that it was worth everything to go to a cross. And not only that, but to ascend into heaven and to prepare a place for us. And uh, I know we just entered into a new building about a year and a half ago, and it was wonderful. And our construction phase was about eight months, and our planning phase was about three years. And Christ ascended almost around 2,000 years ago. What kind of a place that is having that time put into it will be prepared for us? Listen, my friend, God loves you. You matter. He has shaped you to be who you are. Don't shy away from it. Just ask him, Lord, point me in the right direction and then use me for who I am to touch somebody else's life. Praise God. We love you all so very much. Let's just close with a word of prayer. Jesus, Lord, I love you and I praise you. I thank you for each person that's here. I'm thankful that they've taken the time to watch this and listen to this and engage with this. I'm asking you, Lord Jesus, to help each one of us find our shape. Help us to identify our gifts, our heart, our abilities, our personality, our experience, and let them all be blended together for your kingdom. We'll be careful to give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.